only within national groups, not across them, as was the project all along. The second attempt that I discuss in chapter four of the book, on a smaller scale, was the radical leftist Matspen organization, which also experienced many splits related to positions regarding nationalism and socialism, but these splits did not distinguish clearly between the Jews and Arabs as the more mainstream Communist Party splits did. It is this last movement which was the least significant organizationally, but perhaps with the greatest impact intellectually, which is accounts for why I'm, I'm particularly interested in it, which provides us with the key to the future. It presented the most critical independent perspective on post-1967 Israel by linking the occupation both to internal ethnic relations within Israeli society and to the historical legacy of Zionist settlement and the Nagba outside of Israeli society. It opened the way to dozens of critical Israeli scholars and social and political movement, even if many of them never knew or bothered to acknowledge its pioneering activist and analytical role. It's also the one movement discussed in the book that I can speak about from personal experience and could say much more in this regard, but I don't want to deprive you of the opportunity to find out more by reading the book directly. So in terms of my positioning, if you do read the book, this is my sort of alma, political alma mater, and I have some differences with its history, but that's where I come from, and I think it's also quite uh, obvious uh, from the book where my sympathies lie. I'll finish on this note, and uh, just on a technical note, um, if you want a copy of the book, talk to me after the event, but I made photocopies of the preface and the conclusions that are freely available in the back. So if you haven't got a copy, please do so. Um, and that will give you a better sense of what the book is all about. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. I'd like to invite the uh, Jewish Voices for Justice representative to say something briefly before we proceed to our uh, discussion. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is David. I'm from Jewish Voices for Just Peace, JBJP. We're a group of Jews who add our voices to the growing number of, the Jew of Jews who dare to disagree with the current blind support that Israel, enjo uh, that Israel enjoys in the mainstream Jewish community. Uh, we mainly work to provide a range of information on Israel and occupation. Rand spoke at our first event and helped us in launching JBJP. And in the wake of the success of this event, we have been able to hold several well-attended events in the short time that we have existed. As you have heard, Rand has a great understanding of history and an enormous depth of, of knowledge which he presents in an incredibly accessible way. His authority on the subject matter comes not only from his research, but also from his direct knowledge of the area from which he used to live, in which he used to live. JVJP does not itself assume any particular position around Zionism or anti-Zionism, since we are a human rights-based group. We support this book because we support the broadening of knowledge uh, of the region's past. The information it provides helps us, to, uh, helps us to better understand the history of the region, through which we may better be able to see a peaceful solution to this unending conflict. We are privileged to have the authority of RAN amongst us, and we welcome the publication may it lead to fruitful debate and valuable discussion. Thank you. Um, okay, so, uh, Ryan, I found, uh, as I said in the introduction, I found the, uh, the book to be an extremely uh, informative uh, both record and analysis of uh, it's a kind of political, uh, intellectual history almost of the uh, analysis of the Israel Palestine conflict from the point of view of. Various, uh, the various critics of Israel and Zionism, or, or at least Zionism as it came to be uh, understood. Um, and uh, I thought you were saying something very uh, interesting uh, at the beginning of your uh, verbal presentation that I think has a potential point of connection with some of the issues you, you raise in the book. And that has to do, I suppose, with the question of uh, class-based struggles for socialism versus the, uh, the, the national struggle for uh, 
either a uh, secular democratic state or a binational state or for two states or whatever it is uh, that constitutes the resolution of the national question. I was just wondering, um, you're talking about the situation in the early 1990s and uh, how briefly the trajectories of South Africa and Israel seemed to uh, converge and then how they diverged and you mentioned uh, the messianism of uh, certain Zionist quarters and Hamas's opposition to Oslo. I was wondering if you could, uh, by way of connecting these two sub-themes, whether you could say something about the, the whole post-Cold War context uh, and how it uh, inflects our understanding of what's going on in the region. Uh, would it be fair to say, in your view, Ram, that uh, with the uh, collapse of communism, as it's known, uh, and the, the end of the Cold War, that the national question ceases to be relevant in the way that it used to be posed, insofar as it was a question about the relationship between national liberation and socialism. Is, is there a sense in which socialism is now effectively and practically uh, off the agenda uh, in these discussions? Has it just reduced down to a national question? And if so, uh, do you think, uh, to the extent that, that that is the case, is that a helpful development or, or a problematic one from the point of view of uh, the likelihood of resolving the national question itself? So I'll, I'll, be, I'll begin by putting that uh, to Ram, and um, I'll then invite, well perhaps in fact before I uh, invite Ram to come back, I'll, so that will be my opening uh, question. I'll invite uh, Naeem straight away to, to come in as well and to uh, put his own question or comment forward for, for Ram, or just as a general contribution. Um, uh, first, le let me just uh, uh, say to get the, the formalities out of the way that we are uh, quite pleased as, as Afro Middle East Center to co-host this with the department and with uh, JVJP. Um, and, and also to say that the, the book was, uh, as Daryl would agree, it was a fascinating book to read. Um, and Darryl, and, and um, Ron's presentation was also, I, I thought, quite gripping. A nice trick by an author, he actually didn't cover in his presentation what's in the book, so you have to buy the book <laughs> uh, if you want to know what, what was so fascinating about it. Um, a, a few things, Ron, that, that are just two or three things that I just want to pick up, and perhaps less of questions and, and comments, if you don't mind. Uh, um, um, one was, uh, I, I thought it was very interesting in the way that, that the book shows, although not necessarily explicitly, and, and then your, your presentation, uh, Ran, about how people's positions um, are so much based on where they're located, whether it's ov obviously geographically, but also ethnically, etc., cetera, um, and also where, the, where they're located in time. I mean, your comment about what would have just been simple Zionist um, in the early 20th century now might be seen as, as anti-Zionist because of, of, the, of the movement of time. But also when you look at some of the uh, people that you speak about that are perhaps most progressive in, in your telling of, of the story, um, some of the Jewish most progressive people, Martin Buber, Buber Magnus, etc., um, very much located within a kind of Jewish paradigm trying to realize equal rights with the other, but the other is always the other. And so the difficulty always of, of trying to transcend that, um, I, I think, comes across in, 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 in that presentation. And I think that if, we, if we're talking about um, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, question being resolved in, in a just way moving forward, this is the most, uh, the most substantial hurdle and obstacle. Um, for, for people located on both sides, and not only the progressives like the boobers. Uh, I'm, not tr I'm not going to even try to find uh, contemporary uh, uh, comparisons. But not, not only for the most progressives, but for all of them to be able to understand the other side. I think that uh, it's kind of become a bit of a cliche now to say that, but, uh, but that certainly comes out uh, in, in the book. The second point that, that you, you also explicitly point out is the question of um, reciprocity. So the notion of, of a binational state, 
which certainly, if you were to believe uh, Iran's book, is the is the best option uh, or the most just option moving forward. Um, Iran correctly points out you can't talk about a binational state if only a small minority of one part of that nation or one nation of, of the Bai um, is actually willing to consider it. So uh, to use contemporary um, nasty term, um, the, the Bubas and, and, and Magnuses uh, and, and others like that didn't have a, a partner on the Palestinian side. Um, and you really can't talk about a binational project if, if you don't have people from both sides, uh, both nations, if you like, uh, talking about that. And, and I think that that, certainly for, for, for Palestinians, um, is something to, to reflect on. Now, I, I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm putting the blame of all of this on Palestinians when you, you know, um, indigenous on a land and your land gets taken away and you get colonized and, and the settlers, etc. It's a whole different dynamic. But I think the, the, the point needs to be made uh, nevertheless. And that, and that brings me to my last point, and that is about what the book might mean in terms of uh, moving forward. Um, and, and let me start with a point there, that while you had this, uh, Ron, and you can correct me if, if you think I'm, I'm wrong, while you had this serious grappling uh, on the Jewish side with notions around binationalism, about how um, uh, how, how these uh, problems might be dealt with, uh, etc., in ways, even sometimes among the most progressive uh, of them, that were, in my opinion, not progressive enough. But nevertheless, on the Palestinian side, you didn't have as much of a grappling. You, you had socialist perspectives, you had the, but it, it wasn't, the, the intellectual grappling wasn't as, as deep, it seems to me, from, from the presentation in the book, um, as, as it was on, on some of the, uh, of the Jewish side. Again, my, my earlier kind of disclaimer type comment, um, Azmi Bishara would say, for example, that, well, we are the ones who, uh, who are colonized, we are the ones who are the victims of apartheid, and uh, so it shouldn't be up to us to have to present solutions. It should be up to them to present solutions and we should decide which ones of them we want. And that argument has its place, I think, but, but I think that uh, um, uh, it's not sufficient. Um, certainly, if you want to engage in negotiations, as part of the Palestinian community uh, does, um, and, and regards negotiations as the only way forward, you really need to have um, proper ideas of, of where you want to go. Um, and I don't think that that part that, that um, in, wants to engage in negotiations as the only way forward uh, actually has a proper idea about where it wants to go. Um, and so. I, I think that, that while the book is historical, that the really lingering question, um, and becomes even more of a question and, and more lingering after listening to your presentation, Ron, um, is what does that mean now moving forward? Yes, we have elections in two weeks' time, um, and the joint list, uh, the Arab joint list, uh, as it was called, uh, the, the joint list has uh, significant potential. I mean, there's some polls are saying that it will be uh, the, the third highest number of votes will go to the, the Arab joint list, which includes the Communist Party, which is not just Arab. Um, there's also some much more optimistic, and I think too optimistic, uh, Iran, uh, suggestions in some media that um, suddenly a number of Jewish people will start voting for, for, for this joint list. For the first time ever, Arab parties will get uh, a number of Jewish votes. Uh, partly because of the Communist Party, but partly because it presents some kind of uh, alternative. Um, so, in terms of, of what the book is saying, um, and, and the history, and, and, and what Ron said about looking back, in a sense the field is open in some ways, to look back at what solutions had been proposed and see whether they make sense going forward. How do they make sense then go, going forward is, is, the, is, is the big question. Um, so I, I, I want to leave it there and, um, and perhaps we can pick up. Okay, Ron, maybe you can just come back uh, at, at those two uh, questions and comments and then we'll continue. First about the context, the global context, mm. the post-World uh, Cold War context. Um, I think unfortunately the tight link that had existed perhaps from the 1920s to the 1980s between socialism or official state socialism represented by the Soviet Union and national liberation movement throughout the Third World has been broken. 
to a large extent because the Soviet Union itself doesn't exist anymore and Russian foreign policy may try to recoup some of the elements of Soviet foreign policy but they are not interested in national liberation anymore. I think it was always a mixed blessing. The Soviet, and we know it from South Africa as well of course, the Soviet always supported national liberation struggles, but they also molded them and shaped them in such a way that was not necessarily conducive for democratic, participatory, human rights oriented outcomes. And we know this ambiguity in the case of South Africa itself. In the Middle East it was even less so because there was no sort of civil society based movement as existed in South Africa that kind of counterbalanced the impact of Soviet foreign policy finding it supportive but also militating for greater democracy and participation as happened in South Africa. In any event, that strong and consistent and significant support rendered by the Soviets, the Chinese were never really playing a, an important role, came to an end in uh, the late 1980s with Gorbachev and, and Yeltsin and, and so on. Um, it's never been restored and it's never been replaced. That meant that Palestinians have found themselves undermined globally because the Soviets, with all their faults, could present some kind of a counter force to that of the US, which was aligned completely with Israel. That's no longer the case. The Soviet, the, sorry, the Russian and the Chinese may be a little bit more sympathetic to Palestinians than the US is, but they obviously won't go out on a limb for them. And so that crucial component is out of the way. Ideally, it would have forced Palestinians and other democratic Arab forces to reshape their action and to move in a direction that is more participatory, open, democratic, and so on. But there were other forces at play and continue to be at play. Of course, we all know AMAC organized a couple of conferences on the Arab Spring, and I think we all knew, found it exciting and exhilarating because that was the long promise rise of democratic civil society forces that would take the left out of its frozen state in the sort of Soviet, post-Soviet era and inject it with dynamism. But Unfortunately, it has encountered serious repressive forces, not so much by nationalism. I think the project of Arab nationalism that was very much alive in the 1940s to the 1960s or even 70s, and I write about it when I write about the Palestinian national movement because you can't understand it without understanding uh, of the global Arab, the pan-Arab national movement of which it was a part. That national movement disappeared. There is no significant Arab national movement any longer. Um, what we do have is the rise of local nationalism on the one hand, Syrian, Iraqi, Egyptian, and so on, which are also fragmented from within, and the rise, of course, of Islam. So the only alternative to this unifying ideology of Arab nationalism that is associated above all with the name of President Nasser of Egypt, and it was at its most effective in the 1950s and 60s, aligned with Nehru and Tito and other third world leaders and the Bandung Conference. Um, the only alternative to this kind of vision is provided by Islamic forces, and the problem with it, of course, is not Islam itself, but that these Islamic forces that challenge nationalism do it from a direction that, first of all, is no interest in Palestinians. It sometimes may use Palestinians to advance their agenda, but they have no substantive interest in Palestinians, and they direct attention away from this conflict. As a result, there is nothing, I, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, so I will not claim that ISIS is a creation of Israel, but there's no doubt that ISIS is benefiting Israel because it directs attention away. It's not a conspiracy, it's just what happens when there are forces that look to be threatening. Same thing happened, of course, with 9-11 and Al-Qaeda. So unfortunately, the post-Cold War period was disastrous for Palestinians and their chances of 
reviving their movement in a more sort of democratic and participatory uh, matter. Of course, it's not just disastrous for Palestinians, it's disastrous for the entire region and, and way beyond it. About the question of Jewish <coughs> intellectuals, I think Naim is absolutely right because um, the bi-nationalist movement, the old one which I write about um, in the 1920s to the 1940s, was entirely Jewish, not just in the sense that its members were Jewish, but their discourse were very much steeped in Jewish identity and culture and religion and philosophy and Jewish studies. Many of them were academics. To the point that I find myself, never mind Palestinians, I find myself um, in a difficult position because I cannot really identify with the concerns <laughs> of 1920s Jewish Central European intellectuals. And one thing, it's, it's something I didn't realize until I started working on that issue in the book. Um, I found a lot of books about the whole range of figures. Naim mentioned the, the two prominent ones, Martin Buber and Judah Magnus. Um, but there were many others, maybe some would know the name of um, Gershom Sholem, who is considered to be the most prominent maybe Jewish studies intellectual in, of the 20th century. And there are many other prominent intellectuals. And what I found to my shock even is that in order to access their work, first of all, you need to, uh, well, you need to know German because most of their writing correspondence, not so much public writing, was in German. They all came from German cultural background but that at Israeli universities, all the study about these people is conducted in departments of Central European history. They are not considered to be part of the history of Israel, Palestine, the Middle East. They are Central European intellectuals. And even though they moved into Palestine in the 1920s, they continue to have the sensibilities, the concerns, the discourse, even the language of Central European intellectuals. And they had much more in common with other Central European intellectuals who moved to the US, to England, to other places, than with even Israeli sort of native intellectuals. And of course, they had nothing to do with Palestinian intellectuals. So that's one of the problems that we are facing all the way to the present, that sometimes the notions of compromise, reciprocity, binationalism, getting together, reconciliation, so on, are uttered from an intellectual remote perspective, not from the perspective of actually immersing yourself in the lives of the others. The others remain others. You don't want to exclude them, but you also don't want them too close to you. And this is one of the paradoxes. It comes up again and again, but now because it's elections time, it's intensified. Every time there is elections, which is like every other year, um, it's intensified. And so we see this weird exchange between Jewish leftist or liberal intellectuals who are in favor of granting more rights, I will just say it very general terms, more rights to Palestinians, but they have very little to do with Palestinians, while those who come, those Jews who come from a closer cultural, social background to Palestinians, which are what we call Mizrahi or Oriental Jews, actually don't want to have anything to do with them politically. They are happy to share the food, the music, the culture, but politically they are completely exclusionary towards them. And how to overcome this barrier is the biggest challenge for progressive forces in Israeli society. It's always been, and we are no closer to, um, to resolving it today than, than ever. Last point about Arab intellectuals and deliberation and internal discussion. I actually mentioned a few of them which are quite important, quite interesting. Um, I found um, it's just been sort of rediscovered a few years ago that one of the most prominent Arab uh, 